This video is brought to you by Squarespace. At 8 o'clock on February the 9th, 1964, 73 million people tuned into CBS in America and saw the Beatles' first live performance on US soil. Over 40% of every man, woman and child living in America watched that show, which became a defining moment of that generation. I'm Andrew from Parlogram, and in this video, with the help of our massive scrapbook archive, we'll not only look at that historic show, but the incredible story of the Beatles' entire first US visit. No British group or artist had ever succeeded in breaking into the big time in America. But after gigging relentlessly in Hamburg and across Britain, the Beatles were as ready as they could ever be for America. Except that George Harrison had a problem. It wasn't the fact he had the beginnings of a cold or the cockeyed look of his recently cut fringe. It was, as he explained to June Harris of Disc Magazine, his luggage. My only problem is wondering how I'm going to pack all my baggage into the 66 pound allowance. Worried about our American trip? Not at all. It's something to look forward to. John Lennon can't wait to get there. It's going to be fab, he told me from Paris. I know we're not going to have much time to do anything, but I shall still buy stacks of records. None of us is nervous about our personal appearances or anything like that, he continued. The Americans are just going to get exactly the same thing as the British, French and all the rest of them. Will the Beatles have a baggage problem? Not as far as our equipment is concerned, said George. We're not taking our amplifiers and Ringo's not taking his drum kit. We've been promised the use of everything we need over there. But although they're not particularly worried about America, the Beatles have honoured the trip by having new suits made for their concerts and TV shows. They're light grey, said John. Four buttons and a funny kind of pleated back with velvet collars. But other than this, we haven't gone raving mad buying things for the trip. We just haven't had time. With a successful year behind them, and even bigger things like a film and a tour down under to look forward to, the Beatles were overflowing with confidence as they walked across the tarmac at London Airport that cold February morning. They now had six records in the Hot 100, and collective sales of I Want to Hold Your Hand had now passed the three million mark, and their debut Capital album, Meet the Beatles, was up to number nine. Seeing this juggernaut coming, other record companies were also falling over themselves to release Beatles or Beatles-related records too. In addition to Swan's She Loves You 45, VJ had re-released Please Please Me as a single, despite having lost the rights to distribute Beatles records back in August 1963. Other labels such as Cameo Parkway also jumped on the Beatles bandwagon by releasing an album on its Wincoat label by a vocal group called The Liverpools, titled Beatlemania in the USA. They also issued a single called The Boy with a Beetle Hair by a group called The Swans. And on Dimension, there was A Beetle I Want to Be by Sonny Curtis. And what about the fabulous looking Bootles from Hollywood with their single, I'll Let You Hold My Hand? Cadence even re-released the Everly Brothers' Wake Up Little Susie, where they billed the brothers as the American Beatles. If you want to hear what those songs sound like, I'll put links to YouTube videos of all of them in the description. Such was the demand for the Beatles that Brian Epstein was even offered a gig at Madison Square Garden, which he turned down. The trip was also to be 23-year-old Cynthia's first big moment in the spotlight, and a Daily Mirror photographer captured this superb photo of her and John as they made their way towards the plane. I'm terribly nervous and excited at the same time, she said, as hundreds of girls sobbed, please don't go. However, Poor Cynthia was under strict instructions not to say a word, and even had her own minder to bat away any inquisitive journalist. Pan Am Yankee Clipper Flight 101 was met by 5,000 screaming teenagers at John F. Kennedy Airport. Fans had travelled from all over the country to be there. In scenes, an airport official said rivalled anything since General MacArthur returned from Korea. Daily Express reporter David English was in the thick of it and spoke to some of the waiting crowd. Many of the boys had combed their hair the Beatle way and were carrying signs saying, Welcome to Beatlesville, USA. I talked to one boy, Bruce Patterson, age 15 of Fairlawn, New Jersey, who had hitchhiked 30 miles to get to the airport. 
Half of my class cut school today to be out here, he said. Why are we crazy about the Beatles? Well, it's hard to put into words, but you get a feeling when they sing that they're really swinging guys, and they sing good songs. They're not sorry for themselves. They're more of boys' singers than girls. Which emphasises one surprising thing about today's reception. 70% of the fans were boys. But the girls who turned up did their best to be noticed. George also had a column in the same newspaper and, with the help of Beatles press officer Tony Barrow, gave his impression of their arrival. They told us it would be fab, but this was ridiculous. We've seen some mobs of fans in our time, but somehow we weren't prepared for what was waiting for us at New York's Kennedy Airport. There won't be many there, said Ringo. The airport's too far out of the city. Was he wrong? The welcome was overwhelming, and I don't mind telling you, we were quite glad to see those big Irish New York cops waiting for us at the plane's ramp. There was a good solid scrum and they finally got us inside. The customs men looked through every bag, but they didn't take anything except our autographs. And all the time we could hear the fans shouting and screaming outside. Not that they misbehaved themselves. In fact, I thought they were a good deal more civilised than the American photographers who were jumping up and down and screaming like a lot of maniacs. It didn't help when Paul, for a gag, told some of them that we were really all bald and had to wear wigs. Some idiot took him seriously and grabbed a handful of hair to try and prove the point. In now familiar scenes, hundreds of reporters and photographers, plus seven TV cameras, filled the press conference room to bursting point, and America got its first chance to find out what the Beatles were all about. After the madness of the press conference, the Beatles had a short time to draw their breaths during the journey from the airport to their luxury 12th floor suite at the Plaza Hotel, listening to local radio on Paul's transistor as they went. Meanwhile, the newspapers tried to get at the heart of why the Beatles were so popular and why a city as tough and cynical like New York had been so captivated by the group. American teenagers are bored with their current pop idols. They all sound the same. They all look the same. The Beatles sound different. Even if old hat and brother, they sure look different. A psychiatrist told me it's the haircut that plays a key role. American youth is tired of being forced to be conformist. The clipped haircut has become a hated uniform. The Beatles haircut takes the boys back to the frontier age, Davy Crockett and all that. And the girls are tired of the standardised all-American boy. They go for the long-haired French and Italian movie stars. And today is the turn of your British Beatles. Along with bruises from being hustled at the airport, George now had another problem, a high temperature and a sore throat. A bug gets one of the Beatles, wrote the News of the World, which reported that doctors had ordered George to bed to rest, but he was kept busy there on the phone to Murray the K. If you're a creator or entrepreneur with skills or a service to sell online, this video sponsors Squarespace could be the answer you're looking for. Squarespace is the number one online website building platform, which will help you create a fabulous looking website in next to no time. Build your audience for your service with Squarespace's email and newsletter templates and make them fit perfectly to your brand or style. Then measure their performance by using Squarespace's powerful integrated analytics to see exactly where your customers and traffic are coming from. Squarespace also allows you to add third-party extensions from all of these companies and more to help you manage, optimize and expand your business. And it's all backed up with their award-winning customer support, which is with you 24 seven. So why not check out squarespace.com for a free trial? And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash parlogram to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. While George was recovering in bed, John, Paul and Ringo went out to do a photo shoot. Charming everyone and everything they met on the way. After the freezing photo call, the Beatles headed to Studio 50 for the first in a series of rehearsals for tomorrow's Ed Sullivan show. Now, as we heard earlier, Ringo didn't bring his drum kit with him and note that his drum head at the rehearsals was blank but he did bring a brand new Remo Weatherking drum head with the Beatles' Drop T logo on it, which had been painted by Edwin Stokes, especially for the trip. 
The drum head on Ringo's drums, which was incidentally number two of seven, was auctioned in 2015 for two million dollars. Despite having been given a shot of penicillin, George was still unwell that morning and remained in bed. Meanwhile, the other three headed down to Studio 54 yet another rehearsal, with George's place being filled by their uncomfortable looking road manager, Neil Aspinall. However, by early Sunday afternoon, George had recovered sufficiently to make it out of bed and down to the theatre. Although the songs the Beatles performed live later that evening were the first to be seen by American TV viewers, they weren't the first performed to a live American audience. That Sunday afternoon, before a different audience than the one which would attend the evening show, the Beatles taped performances of Twist and Shout, Please Please Me, and, in a different set, I Want to Hold Your Hand, which would be broadcast on Sunday, February the 23rd. And it was this initial performance that was witnessed and reviewed by Daily Mirror reporter Barry Harding. An army of squealing girls tottered into a TV studio here today, on legs wobbly from ecstasy, to see the Beatles on The Ed Sullivan Show. Most of the teenagers had queued for hours in the cold outside the theatre, but inside, the Beatles soon warmed them to fever pitch. There were screams even before the four Liverpool lads appeared. Ed Sullivan, 61-year-old sports writer turned TV compare, showed up in a Beatle wig and tried to quieten the girls. At one stage, he stamped his foot in mock severity and threatened, If you don't shut up, I'll call a barber. When the curtain went up on their idols, the girls let out a fresh burst of screams. You couldn't hear the Beatles for a long time. Then the girls behaved just like a British audience. They bounced up and down in their seats in time to the music, tore their hair, screamed like banshees, and flopped back at the end of the performance, emotionally exhausted. On one occasion, the Beatles shook their mops, the response was a scream like an air raid siren. Now, if you've seen this performance, you'll notice that the sound on it is way better than the live evening broadcast where John's vocal is barely audible. And if you haven't, I'll put a link in the description where you can. After the taping, the Beatles took a break and got themselves ready for the biggest performance of their lives. At 8 p.m., the 728 people in the studio audience were joined by 73 million people in 23,240,000 homes across America to watch The Beatles on The Ed Sullivan Show. The Beatles opened the show with three songs, All My Loving, Till There Was You, and She Loves You. The Beatles then returned to perform with a different set design, both sides of their current single, I Saw Her Standing There and I Want To Hold Your Hand. After the show, the Beatles, along with Cynthia, went to the place to be at that time. The Peppermint Lounge was a trendy discotheque located at 128 West 45th Street, where the Beatles sat sipping scotch and cokes until the early hours. Thankfully, the Beatles didn't have far to go for the first events of the day. First, they were presented with gold discs, one for sales of 1.8 million copies of I Want To Hold Your Hand and another for the Meet The Beatles album. Both were presented by Capitol President Alan Livingston, who announced that both discs had hit the million sales mark quicker than any other in history. They then signed a contract to make three films with United Artists and spent the rest of the morning being interviewed and reading reviews of their Sunday night TV appearance. It was Ringo who seemed to enjoy himself the most, a fact noted by George in his review of the day's events in his newspaper column, titled How Those Girls Love Ringo. Well, we did it. Made our first live appearance on American TV. And it went fine. Mind you, we had something great going for us. The audience. And something else. About half an hour before we were due to go on The Ed Sullivan Show, our press agent, Brian Somerville, handed us a telegram. You might be interested, he said. Interested? It was from Elvis Presley and his manager, Colonel Tom Parker, welcoming us to America and wishing us the best for the show. It was a terrific gesture and made us feel wonderful. So we went before the cameras in great form. The audience was fabulous. They started screaming from the second we appeared. Mind you, Ed Sullivan had given us a great build-up. 
He told them that no one had ever generated as much excitement in New York as us. There was plenty of excitement in the theatre, the fans shouting and cheering like crazy, especially over Ringo. He really seems to have something big for the American girls. But he doesn't know what it is. He just shakes his head and they go mad. People have asked me here, are the American fans any different to the British? They're not really. They still react the same way and shout the same things, except it's in an American accent. They use different phrases in their letters. I had a note today from a boy who wrote that he had no father and no brothers and asked, will you be my big brother? That's a new one. And it's new too, the way the fans telephone. In England, if they get on the phone, they'll go on talking and talking forever. The Americans are quicker and straight to the point. They say, I just want to welcome you to America. I think you're great. I know you'll enjoy it here. Goodbye. Anyway, tomorrow we're off to Washington and the first of our big concerts. And that night, we're going to a masked charity ball at the British Embassy, which could be a gas. Then it's back to New York and Carnegie Hall. That's what we're really looking forward to. Due to heavy snowstorms, the Beatles travelled the 200 miles to Washington the next day by train. A journey which was captured so brilliantly by the Maisels brothers. Over the following 30 minutes, the Beatles gave their first concert on US soil, during which they performed 12 songs in front of a wild crowd of 8,600. For such an important event, its staging was amateurish, even by 1964 standards. George's mic being cut off at the end of the first verse of Roll Over Beethoven, and then there was having to turn the stage 45 degrees after every third song. In his Daily Express column, George called it the biggest and best audience they had ever played to, and tried to describe how it had made him feel. It is really an electric thing. The emotion coming from the fans hits you right in the stomach, then practically takes over. A lot of people say that we played as we have never played before last night. It could be true. We really hooked in and let go. Ringo told me afterwards that he could feel the excitement of the audience going right through him. It's very hard to explain this physical thing. It isn't a pain, but a feeling, a tingling, a vibration that hits you, spreads all over your body until you're glowing. It's elation and it generates its own vitality and honestly takes you over. You feel you could go on and on forever. Time stands still. There's only the moment and you're living in it. That's how we feel, and maybe that's how the fans feel. Afterwards you're tired out, but you feel great. The masked ball at the British Embassy in Washington was a high-profile establishment event, the kind the Beatles would have normally stayed as far away as possible from. But there was no way Brian Epstein could refuse Ambassador David Ormsby Gore's invitation. Especially as Major General Roger St John, Britain's military attaché in America, had gone to the trouble of procuring a Beatle wig. The British Embassy had been swamped with requests for tickets from other embassies, leading to one official saying, we've not had so many people at one of these dues since Winston Churchill was here. Despite the formality of the occasion, things quickly got out of hand, but this time the trouble was not caused by overexcited teenagers, but from violent VIPs. Hemmed in by high society, reported the Daily Mirror, which showed the Beatles being hassled from all sides. Barry Harding from the Daily Mirror tells the story. The scene is the ballroom of the British Embassy in Washington. The four Liverpool lads were there at the invitation of the ambassador's wife, Lady Ormsby Gore, who is one of their greatest fans. They were surrounded by dinner-jacketed diplomats and their fashionably gowned wives. The VIPs surged around the guests of honour seeking autographs, rather like the rapturous teenagers who are their more regular fans. For a few fantastic hours, the world of international politics paid homage to the world of pop music. One woman guest was so overwhelmed by it that she pushed protocol aside and snipped off a lock of drummer Ringo Starr's hair with a pair of scissors. The Daily Express reported on the fallout the following day. Beatles get apology from Envoy's wife. Lady Ormsby Gore, the British ambassador's wife, apologised to the Beatles last night after scenes at the British Embassy Ball in Washington. John Lennon was pushed and pulled by a rugby scrum of young Foreign Office officials. Look, we can't sign for everyone, said John Lennon. Half a dozen young men blocked his path. 
Yes, you can, and you will, they chanted. Finally, the boys conducted the raffle draw in mock Etonian accents. As the Beatles left, Lady Ormsby Gore took Ringo, George and Paul McCartney on one side and said, I really am terribly sorry about the scene in the ballroom. It couldn't have been much fun for you down there. Later, John Lennon said, I like Sir David and his wife very much, but I wouldn't give you tuppence for this lot. The Beatles then headed back to New York for two much-anticipated concerts at Carnegie Hall. George Martin had wanted to record the show, but was denied permission by the American Federation of Musicians. Like the Ambassador's Party, it was an event the Beatles didn't enjoy, and John Lennon called the whole thing a circus, which, of course, it was. Although New York had thrilled the Beatles, Miami, with its warm sunshine and palm trees, stunned them. George, for one, was most impressed. But the constant attention was beginning to get to them, as was the lack of privacy. Not to mention people's manners, as George explained. But the main things that interest us are the sunshine and privacy. Although we've had a fabulous trip, it's been exhausting. The worst thing about America, despite what some commentators have said, is not the teenage fans, but their parents. It's the adults who come to us in hotels, trains and planes who've given us a rough time. They're so rude. Last night outside a Miami restaurant, an expensively dressed man came up to Paul with a piece of paper in his hand to ask for an autograph. This is the way he did it. I have two teenage children who listen to your records. God knows why. I wouldn't but they are going all day long in my house, so sign this. It was the same in the plane coming down here. The first class passengers asked for so many autographs, you might have thought they were going into the business of selling them. One man wanted 13 of each. They talk about teenagers, but some of the so-called adults could take a few lessons from their kids in the case of manners. Still, that's just a minor moan of what has been the greatest trip ever for all of us. After a photo session for Life magazine in the swimming pool at the home of a Capitol Records executive, they went on a five and a half hour yacht trip on the 93 foot pleasure craft Southern Trail, owned by the millionaire inventor of the sofa bed, Bernard Castro. Most of that day was taken up with rehearsals for their second appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show, where a relaxed George and Ringo wore shirts and swimming trunks. The Beatles' second appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show took place that evening, in front of an audience of 2,600 in the hotel and of 70 million on television. They performed six songs that night, starting off with She Loves You, This Boy and All My Loving, before returning with I Saw Her Standing There, From Me To You and I Want To Hold Your Hand. After filming, the hotel's owner gave a party for the performers and crew, and the food included lobster, beef, chicken and fish, a long way from the ham sandwiches they were used to getting after a gig, if they were lucky. With their work done, the Beatles enjoyed some rest days, which included water skiing, fishing and meeting Cassius Clay. And on their final day, even Cynthia was allowed to be seen with them on a speedboat trip. The Beatles truly enjoyed Miami Beach, George especially. We all fell in love with Miami Beach, he wrote in the Daily Express on February the 21st. We think it's the greatest place we've ever seen. We've had a fabulous time. We love our work, but it was great not having to do any for a few days. And it was only while we were relaxing that we suddenly realised that we had had practically five months without a single day off. One day we went deep sea fishing and I was the only beetle to get a catch. It wasn't very big, but it was mine. Paul had a bash at water skiing. He's tried it before, and we all had a marvellous time dashing around the bay in our own speedboats. On land it was just as good. I was lent a blue MG, and the roads were great. Whipping around in the sunshine with a hood down is my idea of a holiday. Mind you, it wasn't all holiday. We were out on a yacht the other day. A whopping great thing, almost as big as the Queen Mary. 
For a while, we just lay on the deck with cool drinks in our hands. But Paul's a worker. He wandered off and a few minutes later, we heard the notes of a piano. He'd found one in the saloon. So we all got up and gathered round. John got a pencil and paper and we started to work on some new songs. Not a bad way to compose, cruising along off the coast of Florida. The Beatles left Miami and landed back at London Airport at 7.40 Saturday morning. Where up to 10,000 fans and 100 police had been waiting since the early hours to welcome them back. Like in New York, the airport was full of reporters, all anxious to get the Beatles' thoughts on their trip. Now most people, after having such an experience as their first US tour, would have wanted to take a break or wind down or even recover from jet lag, but that's not the way the Beatles did things. The following day, they were speeding away from 500 fans on their way to ABC TV's studios in Teddington in a 1912 vintage Rolls Royce. Two days later, they were back at Abbey Road putting the finishing touches to their next single, Can't Buy Me Love. But that's a story for another day. So that was the Beatles in America for the very first time. If you were around at that time, I, and I'm sure everyone else, would love to hear your memories and stories. So please do share them in the comments. Our 60th anniversary celebrations continue with the making of A Hard Day's Night. And of course, the next single, Can't Buy Me Love. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on those. In the meantime, do check out our Patreon page, where we'll be keeping you up to date with what we're working on, as well as behind the scenes news and exclusive content. Your support there or here as a channel member all helps to keep this channel and me going. I'll be back next week with something else, but I'm done for this one. So I'll say bye for now and thanks for watching.